It's doing it. Hello. Hello. Awesome. Okay, it's finally working. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> oh, this for some reason it would not let me connect at all. Um worked perfectly fine when I did the pickup video at the beginning of the month or at the end of last month, but for some reason today it just didn't want to let me do it. Uh, but I've been fiddling around with it for the last couple minutes and got it to finally set up. How's it going, Jason? I see you there. You were waiting. I'm appreciated. Awesome. Um, so, welcome to the first in a hopefully long-running series of collection videos. So, this is inspired by Musty Hobbit when he was moving to his new house. He did a whole bunch of collection videos to show what was in his collection before he moved, just in case something got lost. And even Jason was talking about doing something like this. And it kind of inspired me to do something as well. Because I'm, this is not a pickup video. I wanted everyone to know that in advance. Um, this is something to also catalog what I have currently in my collection just in case something happens. And have it out there, you know, just in case. Um, also, yes, you see what I get in my pickup videos. But... You know, what you don't see is, I might not like something that I've picked up in one of those videos, or something broke, and or something I bought was defective and I had to send it back, or I sold something, or whatever. Like, things that you see in the pickup videos don't always stay in my collection. So this is to hopefully show off the things that I have kept, and to catalog it also. keep Put it out there for the world, just in case something happens, I can say, look, these are the things I have as of right now. Take note. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to go from the beginning to current. So, beginning meaning the the earliest console I collect for, and that is the Atari 2600. I've got everything here from the Atari 2600, the Intellivision, the ColecoVision, and the Vectrex. And if people like what they see with this video, then I will continue going through every console in my collection and giving it its own video. But because I don't have, like, a massive amount of Atari 2600 games or games for any of these earlier consoles, I figured I'd just combine them into one video. Make it easier for everybody. So, is the sound okay? Everything sounds good? I'm actually... It actually allowed me to use my, my Yeti microphone today, which is surprising. So, let me know, and I will get going. Got a few people already joining the stream. Awesomeness. How is everybody doing tonight? Sounding good? Awesome. Let's get going. So, Atari 2600. Ooh, this is a precarious stack. <laughs> okay, so Atari 2600 is the console that got me into video games. I'm going to make some room here so I have some place to put the games once I talk about them. Uh, back in, I do believe it was 1980, my father bought an Atari 2600, Atari 2600 essentially for his use. Um, and my brother and I were the ones that ended up using it the most because not too long after he bought the 2600, uh, and he realized the games that came out for the console weren't like complex, like for something that an adult would be able to enjoy, at least some of his, someone of his age, uh, he ended up getting eventually an Atari computer where he played Ultima and all these other role-playing games like Planetfall and Zork and all that kind of stuff. And the Atari 2600 eventually became mine and my brother's. And whenever, you know, there was a new game that came out we wanted, we would ask our parents for it. We would save our allowance, whatever, and buy new games. Uh, so this was the console that got me into collecting in the first place. So I have a very deep fondness for it. Even though now you play the games and you're like, oh, look, it's a bunch of little dots moving around the screen. Who gives a crap? Uh, just because it looks like crap doesn't mean it doesn't, doesn't mean it's not fun. Which is something I always tell everybody when I say, hey, I had a lot of Atari 2600 games and everyone's always like, or at least people like that I talk to generally, not like gamers and stuff like that. But like, you know, I remember the Atari 2600, that thing looks like ass nowadays. Well, yeah, it does because it was made in the 70s, you know, and died in the 80s. So, of course, it's not going to look as good as it does nowadays. It doesn't mean the games weren't fun. There was a reason why they were so popular to begin with. So, let's get going with this. Game number one is, yeah, The Adventures of Tron. Uh, I'm a huge Tron nut. Uh, I've one of my goals early on in collecting back in 2013 or whatever it was, or 2014 was to get as all the, get all the Tron console games, and I basically completed that task. 
Uh, I just have to get a couple of the other console versions of Tron Evolution. I have it for the 360. I just want to. I just need to get it for the PS3. You know, it's a duplicate game. Whatever. Let's stop talking about that. Uh, Adventures of Tron. This was one of the Tron games I did not have back in the day when I was a kid. Uh, this uh, came out by what's this Mattel, and it is essentially like a platformer. And you're just going up these levels, trying to avoid recognizers and bits and all this other kind of... The tanks and all that kind of stuff. It's not too complicated. Um, it takes a little while to get used to figuring out what all the different icons that are th you know, moving around the screen are. And once you know what you can touch and when you can't touch, you're good. And, um, I, yeah, so I never played this back in the day. This was one, that, one of the Tron games I never had. But playing it nowadays, once you get the hang of it, it's actually kind of fun. I really enjoy that one. Here, this one is the game that is one of my favorites from childhood. I know, uh, I can't remember, was it Brett Weiss? Uh, I was in Brett Weiss's book. I think it was Brett Weiss who wrote that he thinks this is like one of the worst Atari 2600 games ever. I played the crap out of this when I was a kid. I absolutely loved it. You're, you play as this dude who's trapped in a submarine. There are loose bombs rolling around. They make it look like they're chasing after you when you play the game, but really they're just kind of rolling around and you have to avoid them. And get like these rods that will open the next level. And you have to get to the uh, top of the sub to get out because your air is running out and you need to ventilate the sub. Once you do that, the whole game repeats. Where's bitch? I haven't hit the bees yet. It's coming, Jason. <laughs> um, so airlock, I think it's very fun. It's like a it's a platformer, I guess, of I guess those were called platformers back then. Like Mario's, I guess, the first platformer, but this is just jumping. And doing, you know, the same thing over and over again. A lot of jumping. So basically all jumping. But, and I always like the fact that the guy in the cover looks like he's wearing an outfit from Tron. That might have been one of the reasons why I wanted this game in the first place. I was like, ooh, he looks like one of the guys from that movie. Uh, really fun. Data Age was one of my favorite developers for the Atari 2600. Next up, we have one from 20th Century Fox that's Alien. This is a Pac-Man clone. <laughs> Um, surprised the hell out of me. I never played this back in the day. Never had it. But I want to say in the late 90s, uh, when I was collecting heavily, uh, I found a store in like a really rich neighborhood that was all retro games. And they had a loose copy of this. Back then, I didn't really care if I had a loose copy or not. Um, and I picked it up because Alien. Alien is awesome. It's one of my favorite films. And bring it home and I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> it's a, you can kind of see it on the back. But yeah, it's essentially a Pac-Man clone or I guess like Wizard of War type of game. And it's okay. It's It doesn't really use the license very well, but it's an Atari 2600 game. What do you expect? But it's actually kind of fun and it's just cool to say, yeah, I have a game for the Atari 2600 that's based on Alien. So I got that at the... Well, I was planning on picking this up at the Midwest Gaming Classic in 2018. Uh, didn't I, I saw it at a table on Saturday and I was like, I'm going to have to come back on Sunday, you know, tomorrow barter with the guy to get it because uh it was kind of expensive I'll, i'm like i'll try to get get it for cheaper and when i went back on sunday it was gone ended up getting uh, getting it off ebay for cheaper than i would have probably gotten it at that convention anyway uh, another game is amadar it is like kicks i want to say uh it's like you play as like a a paint roller and you have to like block off sections of the level the only thing is with kicks was you did it yourself you picked what sections you wanted to uh to block off you weren't limited to ones that were predetermined like it is in this game where you basically already have every level or area area that you can block off predetermined you just have to you know go around it with the color of your roller it's pretty fun i mean i guess it's an it's atari 27 game what do you expect it's not gonna be super awesome and amazeballs like you know the last of us but it's actually not too bad. I think this is actually based off of an arcade game, but I've never seen that in person. Next up is another one from Mattel. It's Astro Blast. This one is a shmup, kind of like Space Invaders. Uh, your ship is at the bottom of this, or yeah, your little ship is at the bottom of the screen. You scroll back and forth and shoot everything that is coming down the screen towards you. Nothing really complicated. I got this in a lot with, I do believe it was Adventures of Tron and the all, all the other. Mattel games in this stack except for one. Uh, so I got like this big M Network uh, lot on eBay early on in my collecting. I remember I was Thanksgiving and I was at my relative's house in Ohio. 
And I was just putzing around on the couch on eBay, and I said, ooh, I saw this lot on eBay, and I went, ooh, time to time to put a bid in on that. And I won. Got a nice bump for the collection early on, even though I didn't have anything to play it on early on either. I did not have an Atari 2600. Uh, one of my all-time favorite games for the 2600, it's Atlantis, because Imagic is probably my favorite developer for the console. And what it is, is like a t it's a defense game. Uh, it's a little bit like Space Invaders. Uh, you have, basically, Atlantis is your home. You have three gun emplacements, and ships are flying by trying to bomb you, and you have to shoot them out of the sky before they can. And this game is just so much fun. It's, it gets really, really hectic. It's a simple, it's one of those games where it's like a simple premise that just is made really well. And there's actually, I think one of the rarest games available for the Atari 2600 is the sequel to Atlantis. That I guess never really made it out of the prototype stage, but there's like a handful of prototype carts that got out. So I will never be able to own a copy of that because I know it goes for like thousands of dollars. It would be cool too because, like I said, this is one of my favorite games to have the sequel. It would be fantastic, but it's not going to happen. But I still play the crap out of this because I have the, um, what's it called? The Retron 77, the the high def, uh, ret, or what's it called? Hyperkins high def Atari 2600 clone console. And out of all the games I have here in this stack, this is one of maybe three that gets like a lot of play for me when I when I am in the mood for something like that. Pick this up at uh, People Play Games, which is the video game, the retro game store that used to be in Chicago, and it's gone now. But they had like a, hey, we're going to be open for one day to sell all the remaining stock. It was almost a year after they had closed. They, they're like, I got an, a message on Facebook saying we're going to be open for one day to sell all the remaining stock that we had when we closed. Because the guy that was going to sell the building that the store was in never did sell the building, because I guess it was going to get... Hey, how's it going, Cabot? What's up, dude? Um, the guy that told them that he was going to sell the building to get redeveloped into condos or whatever, just the deal never went. So the store was left untouched for almost a year. So the owners were able to convince the guy that owned the building to let them in for one day and just sell everything that they had left over to make some extra money. All the people that worked there back when I was going to the store all the time actually were there that weekend helping out. It was really kind of cool to see them again. And turns out like some video game store in southern Illinois came up and after I left and pretty much bought everything that they had left, which is crazy. But one of the games I picked up while I was there was Battlezone, which is a tank simulator game. I do believe in the arcade this was like a, um, a vector graphic type of game. You know, the wireframes. But you can't do that on the Atari 2600. What are you, crazy? To even think something like that could have po it was possible? Uh, so yeah, this is like the port of it. And I played the crap out of this when I was a kid. This, and there's a game very similar to it by Activision that I played all the time. I don't own it. It's called Robot Tank. Actually, I think Robot Tank is more fun than Battlezone. But this is the, the first version of that type of a game. Next up is a real generic one. I got this in a lot as well. It's called Breakaway 4. And essentially all it is is a, is a ripoff of... Breakout. Arkanoid, whatever you want to call it. Why there's four different cartridges of Breakaway, I don't know if that's even the case. But on the back, all it says is the games on this are break out, Breakaway and Breakthrough. So if you were to think that Breakaway, four different versions of the game, this is why it's, it's uh, number part four, no, you'd be wrong. <laughs> I don't know the reasoning behind this, but yeah, it's Breakout. That's all it is. Uh, here's one of the other games I got in that lot of M Network games back in the 2014. It's Burger Time, another one of my favorite arcade games. Uh, the port is okay. Um, it's obviously very limited in what you could do. You know that the Atari 2600 wasn't a graphic powerhouse like the ColecoVision or the Intellivision were, uh, so it's very strange looking and simple. But the core gameplay is exactly the same, and that's what matters. And it's still fun. Um, but honestly, if I'm going to play Burger Time at home, I'm going to play the NES port. But you're basically just running up and down levels, or up, running up the, and down these ladders on these platforms. You're trying to, uh, you have to walk over these sections of a burger, like the bottom bun, the burger patty, the lettuce, and then the top burger bun, and get them to the bottom of the screen. Every time you walk over them, they drop down a level. And once you've dropped everything down to the bottom where it completes the burger, the level's over, there's enemies chasing you around your only weapon is a, a pepper shaker 
Like, there's an egg chasing you and a, and a wiener or a hot dog. And you throw pepper in their eyes, I guess, and they get all distracted and you can run past them. It's really fun. I really enjoy that one. Very cool idea for an arcade game. Uh, one I got... This is from Sega. Uh, Sega was making Atari 2600 games. I guess Coleco licensed all the Sega games that they were making for the arcade back then for play on like the ColecoVision and the Intellivision and the Atari. Uh, this one's Carnival. I still haven't played this one. <laughs> so I honestly cannot talk about it. I never had this back in the day. But all it says is how to play. Ready, aim, fire. It's the closest thing you'll ever find to an old-fashioned shooting gallery. There's the idea behind the game. It's a shooting gallery. Alrighty then. I guess you have a cursor and you move over items. Oh yeah, there's bunnies and ducks and bears. Yep. There's only one picture on the back of what it is. But, okay, yeah. I'll have to try that one out. Like I said, the, there's a couple games in here that I just keep on saying, like, I'll play that later. And that was one of them. <laughs> uh, another game I picked up is from my other my other favorite developer for the Atari, and that's Chopper Command. Uh, this is a very simple shooter. It's a shmup. Moving right and left across the screen, taking out enemies. It's not complicated. It's nothing special. It's okay. Uh, but here's another one of the ones I played all the time when I was a kid. And I mean all the time. If it wasn't Atlantis, it was this. And it's another magic title. It's Cosmic Arc. Uh, you can see on the back, you play as this big, huge saucer ship in the center of the screen. And there's two different screens. There's one where uh, you're, in the, you're in outer space and meteors are coming at you from each side. And you have to shoot them down before they hit the ship because they will destroy it. Uh, and then once you finish that, you go down to the planet, and like uh, the title says, it's an arc, a cosmic arc. You're collecting two different, uh, there's like different species you're collecting to store in the arc. You have to get two different versions of them, you know, the male and the female, and beam them up to the ship with like a, you have like a little saucer that would come out, and you can beam them up. But there's also these two turrets that keep moving up and down the screen that shoot at you to try to stop you from doing that. And you just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. But it's really, really fun. And I enjoy this one a lot. And that cover art, that is just so cool. That's a model. That's like a model that they probably put together from pieces of Star Trek Starship models and then made a cover out of it. I, I approve. Next up is one that I got at... People play games before they closed, when they, when they were closing and they had that big sale. I went over there and picked up a copy of Dark Chambers. And essentially... This looks like... I still haven't played this. This is another one. It's still sealed, to be honest. Uh, this one looks like Temple of Apshai, which is a game that I loved back in the day on my dad's computer. Uh, that was like an adventure... Sort of. It wasn't really an RPG, but it was like an adventure game uh, where you would go. You were going through these dungeons, and each room you'd find... You might find a weapon. You might find an enemy you have to fight. You know, something like that. Uh, this looks really, really cool and very advanced for an Atari 2600 game, which I think is kind of neat. Which is why I bought it. I asked the guy... This one was actually, because it was sealed, was behind the counter. And I asked the clerk, hey, can I take a look at that one? Because I'd never heard of it before. And when he gave it to me, I looked at the back and I said, oh, wow, this actually like looks like Temple of Abshai. I think I need this in my life. So I bought it. Arkanoid is my favorite version of the Breakout clones. I still don't have Arkanoid for the NES, which is a damn shame. But I would love to get the version that comes with that little controller that you used uh, back in the day. I think it was a bigger box version. Uh, what's happening? Let's see these games. What's up, Telesplash? Welcome to the stream. Sean Henderson. I have, on my, I have it on my Atari 2600 emulator. Yeah, I, I actually downloaded a couple of games for the Atari 2600, ones that are, like, really expensive that I would never be able to play or I'd never be able to own in a million years, like Halloween or Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and put those on the uh, Retron 77. Yeah, Cosmic Arc is really cool. I just love that, that art style. I mean, like, the Imagic games always have a really cool cover. Uh, yeah, like uh, Sean, like you're saying, um, I hook it up. I bought a I bought a Retron 77. It's it's Hyperkin's Atari 2600 clone console. That's how I play it on my TV. It's HDMI. It actually has a bunch of built-in games built, you know, inside the console. When you start off, I think it was like four of them or something like that. Um, and I can't get my paddles to work with it, but I think the paddles that I have might be broken, so that could be the problem. Uh, but it has, like, the ability, uh, you can download ROMs onto a, a micro SD card and insert it in the back, and don't even have to own any physical games if you don't want to, but it lets you play it on your TV, which is amazing. 
my dad had an Atari 2600, but I have very few memories. It was just before my gaming journey began. Yeah, like I was, I was born in the mid '70s, so this was like my first console ever. So I have very fond memories of playing this back in the day. And here's another Magic game, another one that everyone loves, Demon Attack. This is <laughs> another like uh, Space Invaders clone. Honestly, the way I hear people talk about this game really kind of baffles me a little bit. I mean, I'm sure people have memories and nostalgia toward it, and that's great. That's fantastic. I have nostalgia for games and stuff like that that people could give two craps about. Uh, but, like, the game is okay. It's just basically a bunch of enemy ships coming down at you, like these things that look like bats and alien, you know, flying things, and you shoot them with the little ship at the bottom of the screen that just scrolls back and forth. It's nothing too fancy. It's nothing crazy. Uh, it's a little, it's colorful, I'll give it that, but I mean, like, it's not, like, the second coming, like, everyone seems to talk about it like it is, but there's another awesome cover from a Magic. I mean, that's like, somebody took a T-Rex toy and painted it silver and then attached jet wings to it. That is fantastic. I approve. That's worth only this game alone, is for the cover. And I do believe there's a sequel to that. If I'm not, if I am not mistaken, I do believe so. Here's another Magic game. This is one that I never played back in the day. You're born in 71. I was born in 75. <laughs> um, never played this one back in the day. This is one of the few Magic games we did not have when I was a kid. Dragonfire. Got this at People Play Games when they were closing. They had this on their shelf. I picked it up. Thought it looked really awesome. Even though this is one of the ones from a Magic that has kind of a weird cover. That is kind of creepy. It's like somebody made a dragon puppet and then like superimposed an eyeball onto it. Because that eye does not look like, look like it belongs. It is very strange. But whatever. Uh, the game itself reminds me of Krull. Uh, where, I mean, like it's not like a one screen type of game. There's actually different scenarios for each screen that is uh, playable. One of them is you have to run across a drawbridge. And uh, there's fireballs coming at you that the dragon which is out of sight, is shooting at you, and you have to jump over them, duck, and they come at random intervals, and you really have to be lucky when you get closer to the castle because you can never tell when they're coming or what if it's going to be a high, ball, a high fireball or a low fireball. So the last, like, three seconds of you running towards the castle is, like, really stressful. And then once you get into the castle, like, you can see the drawbridge ones right here. When you get into the castle, you have to uh, fight the dragon, and I do believe it's a lot of treasure laying around that you have to collect. And he will be shooting at you the whole time. And you have to collect as much of it as possible. And really fun game. It's not awesome. It's not super amazing. It's not like Atlantis or Cosmic Arc as far as I'm concerned. But it's a really fun game. And I was like, I love the Atari games where you would have different screens. Born in 82 from the NES Master System generation. Like, I will say, like, when I got NES, like, when I finally got an NES, and that was probably at the very tail end of the 80s, uh, that was where my gaming addiction, like, really took off. What's up, Saru? How's it going? What's up, 8-Bit Glitch? Welcome to the stream, showing off some classic old-school video games in my collection. Hopefully the start of a new series of live streams. Uh, next one up is the Lightning Rod of Hate for the Atari 2600, thanks to the AVGN, and that's a T, the extra trash to rail. <laughs> um, I picked this up at a gaming store nearby called uh, Video Games Then and Now. Uh, I went in there just looking around to see what they had, and they had this complete in the box, in their case, semi-wrapped. It looked like somebody just cut the top off so they can get the cartridge out whenever they wanted to. Uh, but... Really cheap, because I've seen copies of this that are still in the box for 100, over 100 bucks. So, I had this back in the day. Uh, my dad was one of those guys who, because of the popularity of the movie, ran out the day this came out and picked it up. And you know how everybody just friggin' brought it right back to the store and said, this game is garbage, I want my money back. My dad was not that way. My dad was kind of like, we bought it, we're gonna play it. You know, like, suck it up, rub some dirt on it, whatever it takes. You're gonna have some fun with this, whether you like it or not. And I never really hated it. It took a while to figure out exactly what the hell I was supposed to do. Because even the manual is really vague. But all you really have to do is find the pieces of the uh, telephone device thing that E.T. builds in the in the movie. And 
bring it to a specific slow specific yeah specific, can't talk that specific location and then wait for the ship to show up while you're avoiding the fbi dude that's running around and falling in stupid pits and running out of points that let you levitate out of those pits i don't know why you there is a point system to begin with it makes no sense but whoever the guy i cannot remember the name of the guy who made this warshaw whatever his name was can eat a bag of dicks on that front but the game is not that bad it's just it's okay it's not awesome it's okay honestly i think raiders of the lost ark is a worse game than this but i'm glad that i have it because i'm a movie i'm a licensed game whore that's my shit when the nes came out when i blown away yeah um uh, i went to a friend's house who had it and his mom bought him like three games and i had played mario brothers in the arcade there was a bowling alley near my how my home that my mother used to bowl uh she was in a league so, and they had Mario, the original Super Mario Brothers game there to play. And I watched people beat the game. Like, they would play it for hours standing up. And uh, when it came to the NES, when the NES finally came out, I watched uh, a friend of mine play it at his house. And I was just like, wow, this looks just like the arcade. Because basically it was. That, I think that arcade game that was just, you know, a cartridge plugged into it. And uh, he had Deadly Towers, which I thought looked like the best game ever until I played it. <laughs> But he also had Rygar, and Rygar kind of blew me away. I was like, this is fantastic. And I was like, I need one of these, and we didn't get one for like another three years. I don't think we got our Atari, or our NES until probably 1989. But back to the games. Drop you a like, buddy. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I appreciate it. Yeah, talk, they're, like, here's another cool one. Uh, the box art for the, I think that was what sold these games. Because, like, the game is, like, you can't put a picture. A lot of them don't have the pictures of what the game is on the back. Because I think they'd be like, oh, look, it's just a bunch of blocks. What's going on in this picture? So they had to sell it with the box art. And it worked. Because that was basically what my dad went by whenever he would buy one for us. He'd be like, oh, this looks kind of cool. It's sci-fi. Let's bring it home and play. Oh, what, what am I even looking at when we get home? You know? <laughs> Why the hell do you have that crap? I don't even have it on my emulator. What, E.T.? I don't I don't hate it. I really don't. That's another one of those nostalgic. E.T. was Fetch Quest, yeah. It was basically looking for those parts of the phone, putting them together, and then waiting for the, the uh, your your ship to come back, or to come pick you up. And that was it. Thank you, Telesplash. I appreciate it. Um, here's another one by Magic. It's called Fathom. I picked this up at People Play Games before they shut down. Yes, that is a naked mermaid hiding her boobs with that bar from the cage she is in. <laughs> Scandalous. Um, this is another one of those multi-screen games, and each screen is different. So, you play as a dolphin and a seagull. And on one screen, you're the seagull, and you're trying to get past this volcano while shooting, like, lava up at you. Uh, the next one, you're trying to get through other birds. And the next one, you're playing as a... You turn into a dolphin, and you have to dive down below to free the mermaid from the cage that she's in at the bottom of the ocean. And it's... Okay, it's not the greatest thing ever. This was actually kind of pricey for an Atari 2600 game, but I got a discount on it at the store, which is why I bought it, and other than the fact that it was by Magic. So I really, really was happy to get this in my collection because this was not one that I played back in the day. And the cool thing is you can even see the progression of the bird, or the seagull, turning into the dolphin, which I would thought was a kind of a cool touch. And it basically tells you what the game is about right here from this picture, which a lot of them didn't. Here's another Magic game. This one's got kind of a generic picture on the front, but it's called Firefighter. Got this at People Play Games as well. And you guessed it, you play a firefighter. <laughs> you play as a fireman with a fire truck, and you're pissing on buildings trying to put the flames out. Exciting. Here's another cool one from 20th Century Fox. They released, I want to say, like 90% of the games that they ever released for the Atari 2600 were licensed games, and the rest were uh, original games that were really, really good, but they're hard to come by nowadays, because we used to have one called uh, Crypts of Chaos. It's a fantastic adventure game for the Atari 2600, and I need to find a copy of that immediately. If you have a copy of it, play it a lot. It is great. I really want it back in my collection, because it was awesome. I play that all the time. Can't find it for a good price, though. But this one's Flash Gordon. Clyde this, I'm bored. Uh, I love the movie Flash Gordon. It's one of my favorite, like, guilty pleasure movies because it's so freaking cheesy. But this was the surrogate game that I bought in place of Alien 
for the 2600 at last year's Midwest Gaming Classic when like I couldn't find that copy of Alien that I was looking for. But I went to another table and they had this sitting there and I was like, ah, I'll get that instead. I think I paid like $20 for it. But the really cool thing is these uh, games by 20th Century Fox, they don't come in like a standard box like the rest of these do where you just open it at the top, pull the card out. This one has like a little lever and then this slides out. <laughs> And your manual's on top, and your cartridge is just sitting inside, looking all pretty. It even has these little clips to attach, or to hold your, your manual in place. But it's a shmup. Uh, the, it's really like a clone of Defender. It doesn't have anything to do with the movie. I'm assuming that this was just a game that 20th Century Fox bought off of some poor kid who designed it in his room, and then slapped the Flash Gordon license on it, because honestly this has zero to do with the movie. You can see it's just it, it looks just like Defender. You got a little map at the bottom of the screen and down here and at the top you're a little ship shooting up other ships. It's a schmop. It's a schmop. <laughs> How's it going, Flo uh, Rising Blue Phoenix? I haven't seen you in a while. Pissing on buildings. Yes. It's a gameplay type. It's real. <laughs> What's up, Game Grinder? How's it going, Church? Are going to do a reboot of that movie? They've been talking about making a reboot. I know that the guy who did the Mummy movies, the ones with Brendan Fraser and um, Van Helsing, was talking about doing a reboot of this for the longest time. Didn't happen. Fell through. Probably for the best. Because if you saw the TV show that was on the Sci-Fi channel at all, you would know that sometimes things should not be updated for the modern day because it just comes out looking shitty. <laughs> uh, here's another game by Activision. Freeway. Same thing as the movie, right? Yeah, there's spaceships in it. It's it's a it, yeah, it's it, it's a thing. No, it's not. Uh, Freeway is essentially why the chicken crossed the road type of a game. It's like Frogger, but you play as a chicken. That's all we need to talk about. Uh, here's a classic arcade port. Galaxian got this at uh, video games then and now. And the funny thing is, <laughs> okay, so. I went when I went to uh, people or video games then and now. I bought a copy of I don't remember what it was. Oh, it was Dig Dug. I bought a copy of Dig Dug, and it was still wrapped. Uh, but the guy who had sold it to the store, or maybe the guy who ran the store, maybe somebody stole it. Uh, somebody had slit the plastic open on the top, real stealthy like. And peeled it back and gotten the cart, the box open and taken the cart out and just made it look like it had been sealed the whole time. So when I picked the box up, I thought I'd gotten a sealed copy and I didn't. I bring it home, pop it open, where's the cart? It's not here. So I bring it back, say, somebody stole this before I bought it. I should have known because the box felt really light. Uh, so I ended up exchanging it for Galaxian because they did not have another copy of Dig Dug. But Galaxian is another shmup. Uh, ship at the bottom of the screen, shooting at other ships coming down the screen at you. It's a variation of uh, Space Invaders, uh, but I prefer Galaga to Galaxy, and this is like the original version of that series, and then Gal Galaga is the sequel, and Galaga is way better. <clears throat> Here's a funny one. Another game by Data Age, another one of my favorite developers, uh, and that is Journey Escape. Yes, it is based on the band Journey. Should have been gone. No, that's that's not journey. <laughs> um, so it's based on the Journey Escape album, uh, essentially just the box art alone. Uh, but the box art is awesome because that's essentially the cover of that uh, album. But the game is you're playing as this beetle ship thing. I guess they're kind of making it out like it's a car, and that's at the bottom of the screen, and you just move it back and forth as all this stuff comes streaming down the screen at you, and you're trying to avoid it. There's like crazy fans, there's uh, mad fans, there's like other cars, the Kool-Aid Man shows up at some point, don't ask me why. Uh, there's aliens, there's light bulbs, there's bridges, I don't know what the hell half these things are, but yeah, it's just your famous scarab escape vehicle, can you guide all members of the group to the safety of their famous ship before time runs out? Had this back in the day. This was a game that my mother actually wanted because she was a big fan of Journey. Uh, and we played it a lot because you played what you had back then. There was no Funko Land. <laughs> the game was full of cheese. Uh, here's uh, the other game that I picked up that day at 
uh, video games then and now when I got screwed on that uh, Dig Dug. Jungle Hunt, this is one that I played all the time back in the day. I loved playing the arcade game, which had a different name. If I remember correctly, it was Jungle something. Jungle Safari something? I don't know. They changed the name when it hit the, the, hit the home console. I don't know why. But here's another one that's like a bunch of different screens. Uh, you are swimming with alligators, stabbing them in the face. Uh, <laughs> I stabbed an alligator in the face today. Yes, it was a block. It was a little bunch of little blocks stuck together, but it was an alligator technically, so I'm awesome. <laughs> uh, you're swinging on vines back, and, you know, you're jumping back and forth between vines, and then you are running up a hill again. Uh, there's boulders coming down a hill. You have to jump over the boulders, and then the last screen is you saving your girlfriend from being boiled alive and turned into people soup by a bunch of Zulu warriors. Not racist. <laughs> Uh, but Jungle Hunt was always a favorite of mine because it's just, it's a lot of fun. And the multiple screen thing is really cool. Another awesome Activision game, Keystone Capers. Uh, this one is, uh, I guess it's a platformer, I guess. You can see on the back, uh, you're in a mall and you play as a cop and there's like guys that are like thieves that are running around stealing shit from stores and you have to like catch up with them and stop them before they can escape the mall. And it's really, really fun. It's really uh, well made and designed. And the guy who made it, Gary Kitchen, was at the Midwest Gaming Classic last year in uh, 2018. And I totally forgot to meet up with him after his panel to get this signed by him. And I would have loved to have done that and told him that this was one of my favorite games back in the day. With the name, with the name of what? Journey Escape? Uh, that I would have told him like this was one of my favorite games when I was a kid. And I still think it's... Like, a really, really super playable game nowadays. Another favorite from Activision, Kaboom. Uh, this was the game that I was playing when I realized that the uh, paddles that I had bought for the console did not work. Um, the instruction says that they that the paddles will work with the console. Maybe I have to update it, and I'll try it again. But all this really is is reverse breakout. Uh, there's a guy at the top of the screen that's dropping bombs, and he scrolls back and forth, and you control with your paddle like these buckets, and you're trying to catch the bombs in the buckets before they can touch the ground and blow up. Because once they touch the ground, game over. And uh, you lose a bucket. You start off with like three buckets uh, stacked on top of each other, and you, once the, a bomb hits the ground, one of the buckets goes away. And then once all of your buckets are gone, game over. Super fun game, really addictive. I watched Jace Hall. If you remember the Jace Hall show uh, that used to be on, I think, IGN, and he would like always tout, like, I'm the king of Kaboom!, and he'd always, like, every time there was, like, a guest, he'd be like, you know, I can kick your ass at Kaboom. And, like, who plays Kaboom anymore? Well, I watched him do it on that show, and he was actually really, really good at it. And I was like, I remember how much I used to play that game back in the day. And that put a real smile on my face, watching somebody brag about that damn game. <laughs> like, what, 30 years after the fact? 20 years after the fact? Who knows? I can't remember what year that came out. Here's another one of my all-time favorite games for the Atari, Crawl. Uh, this was the game that really proved that a licensed game could be awesome. Uh, I played the crap out of this. I got this for my birthday back in 83, I want to say. And the funny thing is, my dad bought this for my birthday. But the thing was, at that point, I was like 8 years old. I knew where all the hiding places in our house were. And one of them was uh, my dad's desk in the basement. The, there, he had a big drawer that you would keep files in. If you were to pull that drawer all the way out, there was like a space in the back that was left open where he had no files. And that was where he would normally stick stuff that he was trying to hide from us. I knew that this was there, and I opened it, and I played it before it was even my birthday, because I'm a son of a bitch. <laughs> I was a little, I was a shitty little kid, and the funny thing is, my parents didn't even notice that it was unopened, that it had been opened, like, they didn't care, they were just like, yeah, they wrapped it back up and gave it to me, and I was like, yeah, I've played that game for probably 20 hours at this point, but thanks! <laughs> <laughs> I love Crawl the Movie. It's another one of my favorite guilty pleasures. It was supposed to be a Dungeons and Dragons movie when they first were developing it, but they couldn't keep the license. Uh, but this is another one that has a whole bunch of different screens, and each one is different. You start off at your wedding from the beginning of the movie, and you have to protect your bride from the slayers that are coming down the screen. You have a sword, and you have to slash them. And eventually, so many of them will appear on screen that it's impossible, and she will be taken. Next is you riding a horse across the environment, and if you pass over the glaive, you know, the big spiky ninja star thing from the movie uh if you pass over it while you're riding your horse and you hit the button on the controller you'll pick it up you can have multiple glaives because you do the horse thing at least a couple of times in the game 
and that makes it easier for the end of the game. Then you are in the uh, the spider le- the spider web scene from the movie, and you have to get to the center of the web. And once you do that, there's like exits on the sides of the level, and you don't know which one you need to go to to get to the last level unless you get to the center of the, the uh, web first, and it'll tell you which one you need to get to. And you get you see like a little uh, sun setting icon at the top, and if you don't get to that exit before the sun sets. It will change location. You have to go back into the center of the web and try it again. And uh, then you do the horse again, the horse riding thing. You can pick up another glaive. And the last one is the battle with the beast where you... It's a kind of like Yar's Revenge, but uh, hor- uh, vertical instead of horizontal. And you have to chip away at this barrier that your girl is being uh, uh, held behind while the beast is in front shooting fireballs at you. And you have to avoid him and keep trying to chip away at the barrier. And once you do... She will come out, give you the flame that's in your hand from the movie, and then you can destroy the beast. And once you do, game loops over, you start it all over again. Super fun game. I played the hell out of this, and I still enjoy it. So much fun. I highly recommend, if you're going to get one Atari 2600 game, Crawl is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like I, people, I hear people all the time telling me, Crawl is shit. Yeah! It's 80s. Cheese. Get over it. It's fun. <laughs> Next up is another one of my favorites. I talked about this in one of my videos. I think it was um, like games I always go back to when I'm getting burnt out on games. I think that was the topic. It was a, rep- uh, a video reply or a video response to, I think, Nintendo, And that's Laser Blast. It's a very simple game by Activision. All it really is is... Uh, what is it? Space Invaders in Reverse. <laughs> Uh, there's like these turrets on the ground that are moving back and forth and you play as the UFOs at the top of the screen and you can control where they fire and you have to destroy the turrets at the bottom of the screen. And the further you get, the more of them there are, the faster their rate of fire is. And yeah, it just increases, increases, increases until you rage quit. And I remember, I, I think I talked about it in that video. I spent so much time playing this one summer. Like, I, you know how you hear of people when like World of Warcraft was at its peak like in the uh, the mid two thousands, how like people would like not even want to go to the bathroom and they would just keep a jug by their chair and like piss and shit in it instead of actually getting up and walking away from the game to go and use the toilet like a sane person would. Um, that was kind of like the way I was with this because I'd be sitting there like drinking lemonade the whole time I'd be playing this and I have to pee so bad I'd be like I ain't getting up I'm on a roll I'm in the zone <laughs> you know it was <laughs> and like I'd end up like. My be in so much pain, like my bladder would be ready to explode that I would be like, I gotta, no, no, I gotta, I gotta go. And I would run up the stairs and let it off and my stream would be so intense that it would splash back at you. <laughs> TMI, right? Uh, but this game is fantastic and it's a lot of fun. It still holds up. Uh, here's another game that I got in that M Network lot and that was Lock and Chase. I don't think this was based on an uh, arcade coin up but it is another uh ripoff of uh, pac-man uh you play as a cop and you're going after all the all the robbers or all the thieves or whatever and there's like barriers that'll come up and stop your progress that's the only real difference but it's it's okay it's not the greatest thing ever but you know it's, it's fun and spurts i guess it's a 2600 game what do you expect spider fighter patch love that game spider fighter what up gangsta how's it going dude Welcome, Herb Wars. I need to go back and watch the movie. I haven't seen... Crawl is... I think Crawl still holds up. I think it still holds up extremely well. I, I absolutely love it. And the music by James Horner is like... I would I would call it timeless. Because I still listen to it on the regular. I mean, the, the Fire Mares music from like toward the end of the movie is... I think one of the greatest pieces of music composed for a film. Hands down. Uh, spl- hashtag Splashback. Was that the downside with Atari? No pause. Yes, there was no pause. Uh, you basically had to turn it off and then come back. And if like if you're on a roll and you had no way to stop, like, yeah, I, I was screwed. So I remember like the reason I didn't want to get up to to piss was because I like I was on like like stage thirty something or whatever, and I didn't want to get up and have to start over. Here's another classic cheese movie that got turned into a video game by 20th Century Fox. This one actually, thankfully replicates something from the movie instead of feeling like one of those Hellraiser movies that went direct to video, you know, where they were absolutely not, had nothing to do with Hellraiser, they just had Pinhead slapped into it to make a quick buck, and that's Megaforce. 
I actually have this movie on Blu-ray. I found a Japanese Blu-ray of it that is like region free. And it is so bad, but it is still so good. <laughs> oh man, it is. Uh, so you play as uh, Bruce Boxlight. No, 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 what's his name? Not Bruce Boxlight. No, that's the guy that played Tron. Barry Bostwick from Rocky Horror Picture Show. You play as him, and he's on a motorcycle, and in the movie you might remember his motorcycle could fly, and you're taking out, like, all these, I mean, you want to talk racism, like these, you know, Iraq-type house location-type things, and you have to bomb the shit out of them, uh, either on the ground or in the air. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It's not very PC nowadays, uh, but it's still pretty fun. You know, I enjoy it. Uh, Atari Splashback. <laughs> the emulator added a pause button. That's actually... Pre- I don't know if my my Retron 77 does. That's a good point. Thank you for pointing that out, Sean. I would really, really like to uh, check it out to see if mine actually does have a pause button. What website? I got it off of Amazon, of all places. If uh, you stick around to the very end, I might go grab the, D- the Blu-ray for you and show you so you can see what it looks like. Uh, another one of Coleco's games that they released for the Atari. And that's Mousetrap. This is another Pac-Man clone. I got this at Half Price Books of all places, complete in the box. Just happen to walk in one day and you don't see Atari 2600s complete in the box at a, at a Half Price Books very often. So when I saw it, I bought it immediately, but not, not really caring, caring about what kind of a game it was. But yeah, it's a Pac-Man clone. Nothing special. But the thing was... Coleco was releasing these games concurrently with the games that they were releasing for their own console. And I think it was because they realized that the Coleco wasn't really selling, but the Atari was. So, like, we're releasing for people that have, you know, bought our stuff, but, you know, we still gotta make that money. We gotta make that Atari money, son. (laughs) Uh, You wanna talk about, like, people rag on E.T. all the time. This is the game that deserves it the most. Other than Raiders of the Lost Ark, because I think Raiders of the Lost Ark is garbage. I'll probably never own a copy of that. I'll, I'll, I will probably buy it. I lied. I'll probably buy it just because license horror. Uh, but the one that deserves all the hate is Pac-Man, because this is absolutely nothing like the arcade game at all. Uh, it, they lied to us. They made us think that it was going to be this arcade-perfect port, and hell to the MF and no. It is not. Pac-Man doesn't even change directions when he moves. <laughs> he is always facing to the right. It's like, what is he, Derek Zoolander? Can't make left turns? What the hell's wrong with these people? Uh, the, the mazes that you're playing through look nothing like they do in the arcade game. I mean, if they had squeezed the screen, maybe it would have been okay. But yeah, Pac-Man on the Atari 2600 is garbage. I found this at Gen Con, of all places, in the box. Complete. I was shocked that I saw this sitting there. I was like, well, it's here. It's in the box. Might as well get it. Yes, and the the sound effects are god awful, and they use them in Superman three. <laughs> I'm a wealth of movie knowledge. Don't <laughs> don't judge me. I'm a walking talking IMDb. Um, this is a great game uh, by Atar- by uh, Activision. I found this at half at uh, no, I bought, found this at the Midwest Gaming Classic this year, and that's Pitfall two Lost Caverns. It's this obviously the sequel, but it is nothing like the original uh, Pitfall. This one is a real-life platformer. This one is... It has very, very multiple screens. <laughs> Different play styles and stuff like that. There's a lot of things you have to do. Only problem is, because this game has a um, special chip in it, I guess it was for the music, it will not play on my Retron 77. At least not at the current moment. I, I haven't updated it in a while. There might be an update, like a patch, to allow this to play. Because there are certain games that will not be able to be played because of certain chipsets in the games on the Retron. Uh, I have to check again, see if there's an update that I can uh, install. Maybe I'll actually be able to play this. But I found this at uh, Midwest Gaming Classic, and I was super thrilled. I got it for maybe a whopping 15 bucks. And I was super thrilled because I always see that for a lot more than that. Like, oh, past 50 I can't wait for this year, this upcoming Midwest Gaming Classic. Like every, that's the one con that I go to every year now, and like I look forward to it all year, and it's always over way too quickly. Everybody I meet there is so cool. I was so happy that I was able to meet you at the Midwest Gaming Classic uh, finally. Like actually, actually talk to you. 
uh, Saru. It was really, really cool. Uh, I can't wait for this year. I can't. I don't know if we're going to do another panel because, you know, everybody seems to be ditching YouTube for Twitch. So I don't know who's going to be on this year or not. We'll see if we actually get another panel this year or not. Uh, another game. Well, this is a game from Parker Brothers. I think I've only showed one off from them so far. This is called Reactor. This one I've always had a hard time trying to figure out what the hell I'm supposed to do. If you look at the back, uh, I think you're obviously inside a reactor, but I can't tell what the hell I'm controlling. Let, let me read this here. Your ship is trapped inside the heart of a nuclear reactor, a reactor whose core is rapidly approaching meltdown. Time is running short and you must act quickly. As nuclear particles bombard your craft, you fight to blast them and destroy the reactor's control rods. If you succeed, the core will shrink, but if you don't, kaboom! Uh, uh, I still can't figure out how to play this one. But whatever. I think this is an arcade game as well. But, yeah, it's okay. I got that in a lot. 50 year tennis. This will probably be my sixth year, I think, I've gone to the Midwest Gaming Classic. I started going, I think, in 2014. So, yeah, 2014. Yeah, this is my fifth. Yeah, this was my fifth year this year. So, the next year will be my sixth. What's up, Captain Algebra? Kenna forever in our hearts. Even though she probably did. <laughs> Here's another one of these Imagic games that I have like a huge fondness for. This is one that I had back in the day and I absolutely loved it. Uh, it's cryptic as all hell, but that didn't stop me from playing the hell out of it all day and night. That's called The Riddle of the Sphinx. Here's another really cool box art for you. It has, for some reason, they took um, the weird graphical thing that's going on at the end of Star Trek The Motion Picture when V'ger like evolves and explodes over the Earth. And they put it in the background here as the sky. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but you got the Sphinx, you got the pyramids, you got some weird sci-fi stuff going on. Why it's sci-fi and there's no sci-fi things in this. So basically you're playing as um, this little dude that's trying to make his way across the desert. And you have a slingshot, that's your only weapon. You only have a limited amount of rocks that you can use with the sling. You're trying to find water. <laughs> uh, there's little oasises. There's scorpions, there's camels all over the place. There's little buildings you can find. It's really fun. It's really simple. There's nothing complicated about it, but I enjoyed this one a lot. I played the hell out of it back when I was a kid. Little, little kid. Got this off of a Facebook group and another lot of uh, Atari 2600 games that I picked up off some guy that was selling them called Secret Quest. And this was, I think, one of the last games made for the console, or one of the later, like, at least within the last year of the Atari 2600 being a thing. And it actually says, this is made by Nolan Bushnell. Back when they were actually starting to give their developers uh, the credit that they deserved. Uh, and I played this. This is the first game that I played on my Retron 77 when it showed up. Because I was like, this one is the one that I was looking forward to playing the most out of the ones that I had in my collection. Because it looks so cool, and it's not. <laughs> I did not enjoy it. It's very vague and cryptic. And you would think that for a later 2600 game, when they were like... The, 20, the 7800 was out at the same time that they'd gotten their crap together and... Actually try to make a game that you didn't have to figure out what to do on your own. They'd actually be able to tell you and explain to you things in the manual, but they don't. I thought it looked like, uh... <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is getting really dry right now. I just need to get a little sippy sip of my tea. And I just splashed myself in the eye. What the hell? God damn. Um... Dry throat. Uh, I thought this looked like Gauntlet, and it turns out it's like playing Sword Quest. Not cool. <laughs> My favorite Atari 2600 game? Hmm. Probably Crawl. Yeah, Crawl. If you're going to get, if I were to suggest to anybody, if there's one game you should buy for your Atari 2600, Crawl. It may be a licensed game, but it is a very, very good game. Here's another one I got in a lot really early on when I was getting back into collecting in 2014. Slot Racers. There's no pictures on the back. Uh, it's Slot Racing. I'll put this over here right now. They say everything old is new again. Do you think that any of these old games and consoles will ever make a comeback? Well, I mean, they did release all those Atari compilation games for, like, the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. And I think, uh, what was it, Limited Run released it for the Switch? So, I mean, there's the interest is still out there. I mean, I still have a bunch of the uh, 
compilation games that they released for like the PS2 and the uh, Xbox and all that. So, Hero, yes, Hero. If there's one thing I agree with Metal Jesus on, it is Hero. Hero is probably my second favorite game for the Atari 2600. I played the shit out of it. The only copy if I have of it right now isn't like a physical copy. I downloaded the ROM of it because it did come out on the, um, what was it called? The Sega console that was right before the Master System, the Mark, it's not the Mark III. SG-1, I think it was called. There was a version of Hero that came out for that, and I downloaded it so I can play it on my Retro Freak. Because finding a complete in-box copy of Hero for the 2600 is a tall order. It is extremely expensive, because Metal Jesus talks about it all the time. Activision Classics on the PS1. Yeah, I think I have that. I have the class, the uh, compilation, the Activision Anthology for the PS2. Um... I have another one somewhere for some other console. I don't remember what. Here's another M Network, you know, Mattel game that I got in that lot with uh, Adventures of Tron and that Space Attack. Nothing too awesome. It is like playing Space Raiders, which is coming up pretty soon, where it's like a first person space shooter, like a shmup, uh, where you have crosshairs and you're shooting the ships that are coming at you. Um, it's really basic. There, there's no scrolling at all. Like, you know, there's nothing really small in the background and it gets bigger as it gets closer. No, they just kind of like. Slide into frame, and then you move over and shoot him, and then you go for the next one. It's nothing really complicated. It's actually not too bad of a game. It's kind of fun. Here's one I picked up at uh, People Play Games Before They Shut Down. And I bought it because it was complete in the box, and I was like, oh, that cover's cool. I mean, look at that. You're shooting a space brontosaurus <laughs> in a NASA spacesuit. <laughs> Why not? Wouldn't you want this game? I did. And then I played it, and it's it's Star or uh, Space Invaders all over again. Nothing. It, every almost like what is it? Every fourth game that came out for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred is a Space Invaders clone. Uh, here's another one that I picked up at uh, People Play Games, and that is Space Jockey. Uh, this is another shmup. Nothing too fancy. It's not that great. Picked it up for I think four bucks, so I wasn't sad. Pretty cool Activision game. I don't think I had this one back in the day. Uh, but the Stampede, pretty self-explanatory. You play as a cowboy on a horse, and you're trying to rope loose cows or bulls or whatever they are. And it's really simple, but it's actually pretty fun. I mean, I remember when I first got my uh, Retron 77, like, I was like, I should probably play that Stampede game. I never played that back in the day. And I remember losing at least an hour just playing this for shits and giggles. It is actually kind of fun. There's another one. I did have this one back in the day, and that's Star Master. This is another one of those first-person shmups, like uh, Space Jockey, and not Space Jockey, Space Attack, and Star Raiders. Uh, and this one's actually really, really good. Uh, the graphics are actually kind of cool, and uh, it's very, very playable. Still holds up. Because the king of, all of those types of games on the Atari 2600 is Star Raiders. And you might wonder why I'm holding it the way I am. It's because it's a huge-ass freaking box, people. Look at this thing. That poor dinosaur. Barnstorming. I had barnstorming. Uh, the reason this box is so big is because it has boxes inside of it. <laughs> the Calgary Stampede. Uh, the game itself, which comes in its own box, which is pretty cool. And the other box is the special controller that you need to play it. It's kind of like an Intellivision controller. It is a, it's like a keypad, and it has an overlay, which is not in this box. I think it's in the game box. Uh, that tells you exactly what these keys do. Why there are 12 keys on this thing, but only 5 buttons get used in the game, I do not know. But it's actually pretty fun. There's like different weapons that you can switch between and like go into warp and stuff like that. And I had this back in the day. This was like, I remember this game was actually more expensive than your average 2600 game because of the controller being come uh, being bundled with it. So my dad splurged because he's, you know, he's like me. He's, he was a huge uh, sci-fi fan. So he picked this one up and we played this game for years. When my friends were still were playing the Nintendo Entertainment System, I was still playing Star Raiders. Because it's fun. And I highly recommend picking that one up if you can find it with the controller. Here's a, an Imagic game I never did play back in the day. My throat's going dry again. <coughs> and you're going to see something really funny on the cover here because of a, a certain model that they decided to use for one of the ships on it. 
Uh, this one's called Star Voyager. And this one is another Space Raiders type of 3D shmup. You can see it right there. You've got crosshairs, shooting aliens. One of them looks like a crab. Don't know why. But if you look at the ship on the cover, that's supposed to be the underside of the ship. It is the top of the Millennium Frickin' Falcon, people. That's crazy. I smell a lawsuit. Well, it's probably like 40 years too late, but whatever. <laughs> 1982. God damn. <laughs> Here we get into Captain Algebra territory. Uh, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, one of my goals is to get every Star Wars console game there is. If I can. If possible. Pretty close, I think. I only have maybe... When it comes to the Atari, I have two more to go. But when it comes to all the other consoles, I got maybe five. I think. So, Atari, Star Empire Strikes Back... I don't know if this came out on any other consoles like the Intellivision or anything like that. I don't think it did. It might have maybe on the ColecoVision. I can't be positive. I don't I don't have a lot of games for those consoles. But all it really is is you playing as a snow speeder trying to take out ad acts that are walking around Hoth. And there's usually like a uh, a weak spot on their neck, underneath their head. It's like a little glowing dot. And you have to shoot that, and the more you shoot it, the different colors it changes, and then eventually it'll blow up, go and do it again. Over and over again. That's all the game is. Is shooting at ads. And it's not bad. I mean, it's simple. I thought this game was the absolute most awesome thing in the universe back when it first came out. Because I was playing a game where I was playing as a snow speeder destroying ad ads. <laughs> I was easy to please. Most kids were. Except when it comes to this piece of shit right here. And that's Star Wars Jedi Arena. I bitched about this in my worst Star Wars games video that I did a few years back when uh, Force Awakens was first coming out. And the thing about this game is you play as either Darth Vader on one side of the screen or Luke on the other, and you have your lightsabers out in front of you. It looks like you're... Honestly, when you're playing the game as an adult, it looks like a dick-wagging contest. <laughs> and one of those uh, lightsaber practice sphere things from A New Hope that was zapping Luke in the ass when he wasn't paying attention... Uh, is in between the two of you shooting lightning bolts, and you have to block the lightning bolts with the lightsaber, which you control with a paddle. And it's chipping... It, you have, like, a barrier around your character, and the lightning bolts will chip away at it if you miss. And once it, the lightning bolt can actually hit your character, it's game over. <coughs> so, it's a pretty shitty game, because when it first came out, I had a friend who was as big of a Star Wars fan as I was back then, and his mom said, the day that that Jedi Arena game comes out that you've been seeing advertised in all the freaking comic books that you've been buying at the, you know, of the day, well, the day it comes out, I'll go pick it up for you so, you know, you can be the cool kid on the block. And I was hanging out with him that day, and when I got home, I went home with him after school so we could play this game, and we plugged it in, and it didn't freaking work. And we could not figure out why. Turns out it's because there was some sort of a glitch where if you were plugging your paddle into the first player, the player one port, didn't work. You had to plug it into port two. And to two stupid little seven-year-old kids, we're crying because this thing isn't working. And, you know, they took the game back, got another copy, same thing. And it turns out it was a glitch in the game. It had nothing to do with, you know, Atari being broken or anything like that. But we didn't think to plug it into port, uh, the controller into port two. This is not Metal Gear Solid. You know, Psycho Mantis did not tell us to do such a thing. So, it's a piece of crap. It's not very fun, even when you can get it to work. Empire Strikes Back for NES. I have that Empire Strikes Back for NES and for the Game Boy. Uh, back in the day when few people knew or cared about copyrights, not to the late 80s did companies start cracking down on it after Biz Markie got sued for using samples in his songs. Ah. Shadows of the Empire is my fave Battle on a Hoth game, and I totally agree with you, uh, Jason. I totally do. I talked about that in not only my favorite Star Wars games video, but also the ones that I did that was a response video to uh, Michael B. the Game Genie, where it was all about games that you like that most people don't, because I knew a lot of people that actually could not stand Shadows of the Empire. I loved it, but people couldn't stand it for some reason. I do understand. It's a Nintendo 64 game. That controller is ass. Oh, there is... Something I was typing into. 
the chat <laughs> before I can get the camera to work. Okay, and then the other, or the last Star Wars game I have is actually kind of cool, and that's Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle. And I got this at People Play Games Before They Shut Down. And what it is, is you play as the Millennium Falcon, and you have to get to the Death Star. And there's a barrier, you know, there's that, that shield that, pe that people had to take down on Endor before you can get to the actual Death Star. So you're beneath the barrier here, you play down here, and there's X-Wings and all that coming at you. And periodically, you'll see a hole appear in the barrier. And you have to fly through it. You have to do it real quick before it shuts back up and you get trapped again. And then once you do, you can attack the Death Star. I can't remember how you do it. I think it's just shoot a, shoot another blinking dot on the Death Star and it's dead. Um, it's actually pretty fun. There are, the only Star Wars games I still need to have all of the Atari 2600 games are uh, Star Wars the Arcade game. And the one that costs like over a hundred bucks, and it's like Star Wars the Ewoks. It's not the Ewok Adventure. <laughs> it's like the Battle for Endor or something like that. And you play as Ewoks, and you're like crushing the at ATSTs with those those swinging logs. And that's what the game is. It's a really hard to find game, complete in the box. I was following one on eBay for the longest time, but they wanted over a hundred bucks for it. And I was hoping that they would like drop it at some point, but nobody bought it. And it's I think it's actually still sitting there waiting to get bought. Uh, but it, I, I think it was like a really late Atari 2600 game, and there weren't a lot of copies out there. This game is the bane of my frickin' existence from when I was a kid, and that's Sword Quest Earthworld. It's like an adventure game that is cryptic as all hell, and the manual does not help you at all. And it's I still cannot figure out exactly what I need to do. There's like a bunch of mini games in it where it's usually like you trying to... There's like something that's like a, a supposedly supposed to be a waterfall, and it's like a bunch of glowing lights that will scroll up and down the screen with a hole in the middle, and you have to move your character through it as fast as possible. And each one, the hole that you can move through gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's like basically pixel perfect. You have to squeeze through. Uh, there's things that there's items you have to find and leave in certain rooms, and it just doesn't make any sense. The comic book in here has like hints, like as you're playing the game, like these numbers will appear on screen randomly. And it's reference to a page in the comic book and a panel on that page. And there's like a hidden message on that panel of the comic book that came with this game. And usually it's like a one word thing and it doesn't make any sense anyway. So <laughs> it's a super hard game and there's like there were supposed to be four games in this series. Uh, there was we got Earthworld, we got Fireworld, we got Waterworld sort of. I mean it came out like really limited and Airworld never happened. Or was it Airworld and then Waterworld never happened? I can't remember. It's one of the two. But we had Earthworld and we had Fireworld when I was a kid and I hated them. But there's a nostalgic thing toward it because I spent, you know, how many hours trying to figure this game out? Lots. So, try playing it as an adult and I'm like, nah. Nah, not so much. Can't do it. That's another one of those games that I would say is like worse than E.T. Uh, this is based on a movie, but they really don't try to advertise it that much. At least, you know, you think they would put the poster art for the movie on the, the front, but it's The Towering Inferno by U.S. Games. Uh, and it's kind of like Pac-Man, but you play as a fireman, and there's, like, fires all over the maze that you're playing through, and you have to put the fire out with your hose. Uh, and there's, I think there's two different screens, because one of them is the Pac-Man type thing, and the other one is as a helicopter, and you're trying to put out the fires on the building. <laughs> one day I'll be an Ewok. <laughs> Who doesn't want to play as one of the Ewoks? Can I kill them? I would be doing what Captain Algebra did when he did his Wind Waker playthrough. And I would just keep trying to... Dr like, he was kept trying to drown Link in the ocean when he was sailing. i just keep on walking the, uh, the Ewoks into the ATSDs, you know, their, the path of their feet. Oh, Chuda. Yub nub these nuts. Uh, here is... The M Network game that I had as a kid that I played all the time. This is probably my third favorite game for the console. And that is... You guess that's another Tron game. That's Tron Deadly Discs. This is the one that is the most directly connected for the Atari to something that you remember from the movie. And that's like the disc battle that you see like toward the beginning of the movie when Flynn first gets into the, onto the, uh, in the grid. And it's basically... You're in a room... There's doors on the sides that enemies will come through. You have to shoot the enemies with your discs. Sometimes they require extra hits, or more, more than one hit to kill them because they'll change colors. And once they get to one specific color, that means they're going to die. And then you have to close the doors by throwing your disc at those doors so they can't keep coming out. 
And it's a really, really fun game and addictive as all hell. Because it just keeps getting harder and harder and harder the further you get. This is another game that I would play kind of like that laser blast where I wouldn't want to get up to piss if I had to. Because I'd be playing it so much. I'm a less hairy, taller Ewok. Are you Italian? <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, here's another Coleco released game. This one is a port of Venture, which was an arcade game I remember playing back in the day. And this is another one of those multi-type screen games. You play as this little archer guy running through these mazes. And each screen has like four different rooms in it that you can go into. And then once you go into the room, it, it expands and fills up the screen. And there's like an item in there you might need to get that's like, you know, a crown or something you need to steal, like a chalice. And there's enemies in there you need to kill. And each room has something you have to collect because at the end of the game, you'll it'll show you how many things you managed to collect over the course of your play through. And it's really, really fun. Uh, you end up using your little bow. Your character is just nothing but a little smiley face. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Uh, and then when you go to shoot something, a little bow appears and you see a little dart come out. Uh, I really enjoyed this one. This one is a lot of fun. This one actually did come out for the ColecoVision and is way better on that console because the ColecoVision was a more powerful system. Here's a game I played the crap out of in the arcade when I was a little, little kid. And I remember we did not have this port when I was a kid. I'm glad to have it now, though. And that's Wizard of War. It's another Pac-Man-ish type of thing. There's like a maze that you need to go through, obviously. Uh, but <coughs> it's like Berserk also. Uh, he plays this wizard guy. I don't know if he's really a wizard. It looks like a guy with a shotgun. <laughs> and you're walking through these mazes trying to kill all the monsters that are in the maze with you. There's nothing to pick up. There's no dots or anything like that. But you have a little map down here that tells you where each of the bad guys are. Sometimes they're invisible, which is kind of a bitch. Uh, but it's pretty fun. You know, it just keeps on getting harder and harder as you go. I enjoy that one a bit. And the last game that I have for the Atari 2600 currently is Yar's Revenge. Which is probably my fourth favorite Atari 2600 game. I played the everlasting shit out of this when I was a little kid. Oh my god. And it's the simplest freaking game. You play as this little bug ship and you want to get to this ship that's behind this barrier. So you have to eat or shoot away the barrier. And then once you touch that ship it powers up your gun and you can shoot it with this massive blast that will kill it. There's also a little like drone that follows you around that is an enemy and if it touches you you're dead but you're safe as long as you're within this little static field on the left side of the screen it's really simple it gets really really hard because eventually the thing that you're trying to destroy will turn into the glaive and fire across the screen at you and take you out most likely when you're least expecting it aren't all co cabots covered in hair that's awesome <laughs> uh, this is a lot of fun. It's really simple. I really wish we would get some sort of like a... Not a remaster because that would be pointless. But like an update to this game. Like let's expand on it. You know there's a lot of cool ideas in this game. Uh, I can see them turning it into like a shmup. Like a real shmup. That would be awesome. There's a sequel. I did not know that there was a Yars Revenge. Oh is that the one that's available for the Game Boy Color? Or is that just a port? Okay. I need a second to put these back on this table. Hopefully, I will not kill myself in the process. <laughs> Shit! The cops are coming! Oh my god. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna break all my Atari games. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness! Oh, shit. Holy crap. Oh, my God. I'm surprised I did that. Wow. Okay. So, let's move on to a different console, shall we? Sean, please ex explain that Yars Revenge 2, because I am now instant... I am really interested. Okay, so... I still don't have an Intellivision, uh, because I would have no way to hook it up. I don't have a CRT... Uh, I have a 4K TV that does not have a coax plug on it, <laughs> so I would have no way to play it. I don't think my TV would play it even if it did have a coax plug on it. Uh, so, I have, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, I have seven games for the, the uh, television. And a lot of them are because of something specific, which you will find out about in about two minutes. <laughs> uh, because it's part of one of my collecting goals. Uh, but I like them because they come with like these overlay things that go over the controller because the controller to the 
in television was basically just a little numeric pad. And each game required different type of controls, and these overlays would go onto the control and tell you what each button was going to do for that specific game. And each game that I have, I'm surprised, comes with those overlays, which is awesome. That's just a really cool thing. And then the, the boxes themselves are like books. They just open up like that, and, you know, here's like an overlay for, for the controller, just so you can see what it was, or what they are. And it's kind of neat. And when you see, like, a complete one in the wild, I don't care what it is. I'm going to buy it, which is why I have one specific game in here that I usually would never buy in a million years. I found it at half-price books for like $2, and I was like, give it to me! Because I was stupid. Okay, but anyway, I have Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. I watched Brian's, what, Brian from Brian's Man Cave play this one uh, on, what was it, on one of his videos, and I was like, that's really, really cool. I've always wanted to see what that game was all about. Never had it in the television. My friend Sean did. Uh, my friend Sean, who made um, the Metroid wall art that I showed off in maybe like maybe like two pickup streams ago uh, that I went to grade school through high school with. He had it was the only kid I knew in school that had it in television. It's the only time I ever got to play one was when I go to his house. Didn't have this game though, but he did have a couple that are in this stack here. Um, so this one always intrigued me, and it's it's a really cool adventure game. It's way beyond what I would see on an Atari twenty six hundred game. That's for damn sure. Uh, and basically, it's like a maze game you're like in this overworld and then eventually you're gonna go into this dungeon and you're gonna have to try to take out i think a dragon and i watched him play and it looks really really fun and there's actually like not voice but like there's like sound effects that actually sound kind of decent uh so pick this up at people play games when they're shutting down was this when they were shutting down no this is when they reopened for that weekend this was i remember every time i would go to half price to uh people play games i should have bought more of these games there while i was there because they had a lot of uh in or uh, magic games available for the uh in television that we never got on the atari 2600 like dracula and microsurgeon they had all of them but i didn't buy them because i just was like eh, i don't have an television why am i buying it but i always was intrigued by this one uh but this had been sitting in there since i started going to that store back in probably 2011 and it had been sitting on that shelf and no one had ever bought it and then when i went there when they reopened for that one weekend to sell their existing stock uh i, I was like you know what now's the time and that was why i bought this I should have bought those freaking Magic games, but I was a dumb dumb. Oh, okay. Let's readjust a little bit. Here's the one that I bought at Half Price Books just because it was there. And it's nothing I would normally buy in a million years unless it was a Dreamcast game that I needed to complete the whole set. But this one is Las Vegas Poker and Blackjack. Yippee Yahoo. What? Like you said. Oh, cartridge falling out. Oh, don't go. Don't go to the light. Um, has the overlays and everything. Is there a double down button? No, there is not. Yeah, there is! Number eight. Button number eight is double down. That is amazing! <laughs> okay, the other ones I have, uh, game protectors for. Because I've had these for years. I had, I've had three of these for years because I used to display them as part of, like, a specific thing. Uh, you'll see why when I get there, because they are the last three games stacked up here. Uh, but uh, here is Space Hawk. Found this at Half Price Books. The, the day that I decided to get back into collecting was a Saturday. I think it was in October. I think it was in October 2013, maybe. I think. Yeah, it was October 2013. And I had been debating getting back into collecting for like a month. And I finally said... I have this stack of movies here that I don't want anymore. I have this stack of games that I don't want anymore. I have, like, all this stuff that I could sell to Half Price Books. And every time I would go to Half Price Books, I'd peruse the game section, and I'd be like, oh, look, they have all this cool stuff. Okay. Uh, so I brought this huge... It was comic books in there and all that kind of stuff. I sold all this crap. I got, like, $300 in credit. And I kind of went crazy. I basically just spent it all on the video games that they had there. And one of them was Space Hawk. I bought this one and another one in this stack. Uh, Space Hawk is, uh, you play as a little dude in, like, a astronaut, and he's, you can't really see it, but he's like this, uh, where, where is it, where is it, where is it, there he is, right there, right at the tip of my finger, the little astronaut guy, uh, who is shooting at all these things that are coming at him and, while he's floating through space, and eventually you're gonna get into this, caught into a time warp or something like that, and yeah, that's when shit goes wrong. <laughs> uh, I haven't played it because I don't have a television. It just says, if you're adrift in space... A human figure out in the stars is propelled through space with a Black Panther thruster. A back, a Black Panther. Th what am I talking about? 
a backpack thruster. And armed with a laser gun, you roll up big scores by maneuvering the figure to shoot the elusive white space hawk and multicolored bubbles of deadly gas. Don't let anything hit you and keep the hawk in sight until you've shot it three times. It sounds kind of cool, though. I like it. It's like asteroids without the asteroids. Games console. Uh, this one is... This one requires a specific add-on to the Intellivision, and that's called the Intellivoice. It's a voice synthesizer that attaches to the side of the Intellivision. I think it's the Model 2 uh, Intellivision. It's like a, it's like a beige, like a bright beige or whitish color, color console. The cartridge slot is on the side, and you attach this into that cartridge slot, and then the car cartridge is attached to that attachment. That's complicated and convoluted, if there ever was anything. Um... And it would talk. Certain games had the ability to have voice in it. And one of them is called Space Spartans. And this is just like uh, Star or Space Raiders or Star Raiders. It's a, you know, you got a crosshair here. And you're shooting at enemies that are coming your way. And there's a little map over here to tell you where you are in the universe. And it says on the front, it talks. I don't know what it will say. But it probably says, fire, 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 fire. Where did you learn to fly? <coughs> Okay, and the last three games I have for the Intellivision, you'll see why I own them in a minute. And they're all based on Tron. The Intellivision had all the good Tron games. It had a version of Tron Deadly Discs. This one is way better than the one we got for the Atari 2600. I kind of wish my parents bought us an Intellivision back in the day instead of a 2600 after playing this. Uh, but my friend Sean had this one back in the day. And what it is is the exact same game, but the graphics are much improved. Instead of it just being a box you're in, it actually looks kind of like a like a isometric arena. And every once in a while, a recognizer will show up and try to stomp you to death. Uh, it looks way better. I'm I, mm. Why couldn't we have this on the Atari 2600? I mean, it's the exact same game, technically, but it looks way better and plays way better. Uh, the other one is called Tron Mazatron. Stupid-ass name. Couldn't tell you how this plays because even the back of it is confusing looking to me. Uh, but it looks like you're kind of like in the computer circuit boards. Or whatever. And eventually you're going to take on the MCP. Even though it doesn't really look like the MCP. But whatever. You got Tron here. Hands on his hips. Looking like a badass. There's a light cycle in here somewhere. And a recognizer. So whatever. Haven't played it because I can't. But whatever. The real cool one is this one. And this one is... Tron Solar Sailor, Tron, Do Tron Solar Sailor, Solar Sailor. This is one of those Intellivoice games. <clears throat> and what you are doing is you control the Solar Sailor and you got beams of light you can travel across and you basically have to get from point A to point B. And there's other, you, you can travel in a straight line if you want, but as you do that, dangers will be start coming your way. So you can take detours, you can like take another beam of light to another beam. Type of thing. So it's kind of like a little bit of navigation. There's recognizers and stuff all over the place. Couldn't tell you what this is. I think this is like a 3D version of what's going on. But yeah, I want to know what they say in here. Oh, it tells you what it, what it does say. That's awesome. It says the, MP, the MCP's voice will say, you, I cannot allow this or you will regret this. And you'll hear Tron say, energy low, get off, get off. Tron's telling me to get off. Well, if you insist. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and that's it for the Intellivision. Like I said, I don't buy a lot of Intellivision games because I can't play the console. Unless I get a CRT somewhere. Uh, I always said I was going to buy one because uh, people play games always had at least three of them in, you know, in stock. You know, they weren't, like, complete in the box, but they had the consoles. They had the Intellivision, too. They had the Intellivoice thing there, too. I could have bought all of it at once, but I just didn't have, didn't have a TV to play it on. So at some point, when I probably when I move out of this apartment at some point, and I have more room, I'll probably buy a CRT somewhere so I can start playing these classic games like this. Unless um, uh, Hyperkin makes like a console that lets me play all this stuff, that would be rad. I have absolutely one game for the the uh, ColecoVision, and you ready for this? I, you, if you saw the original collection video from like back in 2014, you'll know what this is. Hey, what's up, Colin? How's it going, dude? Hey, bloke. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, I have absolutely one game, and I bought this. I got this off of Indiegogo because a YouTuber that I really liked that convinced me to get back into collecting decided to make a video game or have a video game made based on him 
to raise funds for his channel. That was Gamester81, because it's Gamester81, the video game. The ColecoVision, one, he says is his favorite console of all time. It's the one he had as a kid, unlike me, where I had the Atari 2600. So the three games, there's like three mini games in it, and each one is based off of an arcade game he really likes. One is based off of Pac-Man, one is based off of Donkey Kong, and one is based off of Space Invaders. And you can see on the back, the graphics are actually really, really cool. Well, it's a modern game made for a classic console. So, I mean, look at that shit. That's kind of rad. Can't play it, because I don't have a ColecoVision. But, you can't really, I don't know if you can really see it, but it is signed by him. You can see the silver marker. So, I bought the tier reward that gave me a, the, co the copy of the game in the red box. You can get ones with different colored boxes. <coughs> I think there was like a silver one was like the top tier one. And I went for the one that gave you the red box with the autograph. <laughs> Colin sucks. I absolutely love Yars Revenge. So that's the one ColecoVision game I own. Now here we're going to the Vectrex. Uh, this is a console that I just recently started collecting for. I think within the last year and a half. I want to say. It was, bef it was not too long before the 2018 Midwest Gaming Classic where I bought it. I think it was like that October. So it was probably 2017 when I bought it. I made a video about it. And you swallow. Oh my god. What's happening on my stream? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but this was a console that I always wanted when I was a kid. Always. Every time we would go to Toys R Us, you know, and my dad would be like, we're going to buy a new Atari 2600 game today because I'm a great dad. And I'd be like, ah, would you rather just buy me that Vectrex thing because that thing looks awesome? No, it's $200. I hate you. <laughs> you know how kids normally do when you're spoiled. Um, so we never got a Vectrex when I was a kid. It's vector-based console all on one console you don't need to plug it into anything it's its own television you can see it sitting right here the console itself it's all encompassing got its own tv got its own controller down here if i can get it out <laughs> but i love it i found one on um craigslist and i was super thrilled i the guy that was selling this did not know what the hell he had uh so i got the console itself which is in really really good shape i had to do a little bit of repair to it because like part of it had been like where there was a seam like the seam had come loose and the parts were like not sitting right so i had to kind of like force them back together um so yeah i got the vectrex and i got most of the games in this stack and some of them when you look at them on ebay go for like 300 dollars if they're complete in the box and i basically got every game in here if you were to add up the price if you're to take in the price of what this costs so this probably cost me about a hundred dollars for the console, each game here probably cost me ten bucks, and some of them go for like three hundred dollars, even more or more than that, complete. So I was super thrilled. This I think this guy found this in his dad's attic or something like that. Like, I remember he told me that when I picked it up that his dad had just passed, and like he was selling all of his dad's old stuff. He didn't know what the, he didn't look on eBay. He didn't look at any of this stuff. He just was like, yeah, quick money, sell my dad's stuff, come and get it. And I made out like a bandit. Uh, so the first game I got is Armor Attack. Uh, this is... You play as like a tank or a jeep, I think. Maybe a jeep. And it's like a maze like Pac-Man. And you try to take out all the other tanks or jeeps or whatever. And there, eventually a helicopter will show up. And no matter what I do when I play this game, I cannot seem to shoot down that freaking helicopter because it always takes me out and game over. Um, <clears throat> the, game, the console itself, I forgot to mention. If you haven't seen my Vetrex video... It's vector-based. That's why it has its own screen, because normal TVs can't do that unless it has a certain sort of something in the back here. Uh, so all the games are monochrome. They're black and white. So the, each game comes with its own overlay that goes over the screen to color, colorize it. You know what I'm saying? And it gives you pertinent information that you normally wouldn't have, like which side is player one, player two, how many lives you have, that kind of stuff. Uh, so back to the game. It's okay. <laughs> this one's kind of cool. This one's called Bedlam. Uh, this one is like Tempest in reverse. Uh, you, instead of being on the outskirts of this web, you're in, I wouldn't call it a web, really. It's more like an arena that looks like a web from Tempest. And you're in the center, and things are coming at you from the corners of this web. And it cha every time you defeat that web, it changes shape again, and more stuff comes at you faster. And you basically just have to keep your this little dude in the center. I'm going to tip my finger right there. And you just, you don't move, you just rotate. And you try to kill all the things that are coming down the web at you. It's really fun. It gets really hectic. 
This was one I was really excited to play, and it's terrible. That's Berserk. Berserk was one of my favorite games on the Atari 2600. I don't own it for the 2600 currently. Haven't found a copy of it anywhere. Haven't really been looking either. <laughs> but when I saw that this was included in that lot, I was like, yeah, damn right, I want to play Berserk. I can't wait to play that. I used to play the shit out of that all the time. And this is a really bad version of it. It's slow, and the controls stink. And if you spend too much time, it's a maze type of game. You play as this one dude running around. There's robots all over the place. You have to shoot them before they shoot you. And if you touch a wall, you're dead. It electrocutes you. And if you spend too much time in the level without escaping, this little ball with a smiley face on it called Evil Otto will come bouncing after you and take you out. He did not used to show up in the Atari 2600 game for a while. So you can be in that level for a little while before he would show up. Here, it's like... You start the level, and ten seconds later, his bitch ass is bouncing around trying to take you out already. And it's really unfair. So I'm not really a fan of this. Uh, one of my favorites for this console is the simplest one of all, and it's called Clean Sweep. It's a Pac-Man ripoff. Obviously, you can see it on the cover. It's, it's a maze game. But you play as a vacuum cleaner, and you're in a bank, and you're sucking up money. Like, the dots are money. And as you suck them up, your vacuum cleaner bag will start to get bigger and bigger until it can't hold anymore. And then you have to make your way back to the middle to drop off all the cash and they can keep on going. And there's these, like, claw-looking things that are chasing after you the whole time. And they're basically the ghosts. And if they touch you, you're dead. Really fun game. I like this one a lot. Out of all the games I have, I play this one probably the most. Besides the one that I forgot to mention is built into the console and it's called Mindstorm. And it's an Asteroids ripoff. And not a very good one either. <laughs> uh, from what I read, there's a glitch in the game that once you get to a certain stage, the, it breaks the game. And it, it like freezes up and you can't do anything after that. Which is awesome. Not really. Cosmic Chasm. Uh, this one's kind of hard to explain. It's kind of like playing Sinistar. Where you're like in a free-roaming ship and you're like in these... It's like an arena, but you're supposed to be underground and you're taking out enemies and all that kind of stuff. But there's also kind of like, almost like a mining aspect to it. It's weird. It's uh, Can you save the galaxy by blowing up the alien inhabited planet and get off the planet before you explode too? You must burrow deep inside, fighting your way through the underground maze while battling the planet protectors. So yeah, there's like a mining aspect to it too. It's really strange. It's actually kind of fun, but it's it's different and it takes a while to get used to. I wonder if they could port that Star Wars game to the Vectrex. I'm surprised that they never did. That must have been a licensing issue because all the Star Wars arcade games from back in the day, including the Star Trek one, if I remember correctly, were like vector games or vector graphics games. Uh, and I'm surprised that it never got a port to this console. It would have probably been one of the selling points. They could have used it as a selling point. That might have you know, put them on the map and given Atari a little run for their money. Especially if they sold it specifically to Ve you know, you know, the Vectrex. I think it was GCE. Was the company that made it? If they had sold the licensing rights specifically to GCE for the uh, Star Wars arcade game instead of making it for every console out there, they might have had something. Uh, here's a really cool one. This was one of the expensive ones that I got for essentially ten bucks. Uh, Fortress of Narzad. It's really strange because you play as this little ship. It's, I think you're supposed to be a guy, but it looks like a ship uh, who's down here at the bottom of this trench. Or whatever, and, and and there's a castle all the way in the background that you're trying to get to. And every time you beat one of these little stages and you move up, you get closer to the castle. And you actually will see it get bigger and bigger every time you beat a stage. And all these enemies that are coming down at you, you're trying to destroy them before you can progress. And the thing is, your your shots re are uh, uh, bounce off the walls. So there's kind of like a geometry thing going on where you have to shoot. And if you can't directly hit it from where you're at... You could maybe aim your shot and bounce it around and it'll take it out like further up the, on the uh, screen. Which is kind of cool. And I really like this one. It's a lot of fun. Really unique. Oh, here's one of those overlays I was talking about. This is the one for Mindstorm. I have it alphabetically after Fortress of Narzad for Mindstorm. Uh, but the console itself came with this overlay so you can play Mindstorm. So, like I said, it'll tell you player one, player two. Uh, it tells you what the buttons do. Escape, thrust, fire for the buttons on the uh, controller, which is built in and is actually able to be hidden in the console because it locks into place in there it's really neat so yep a rip off which is a really bad game that uh i can't figure out what i'm supposed to be doing in it uh another one that's kind of like sinistar where your ship is free roaming kind of like an asteroids <coughs> uh 
uh, where scavenging party? Yeah, this is the one where there's like these items on the screen that are like boxes or whatever, and you there are like pirates that are coming into the screen to try to grab them and take off with them. You have to shoot them before they can take off with your your loot, essentially. It's okay. It's not great. I'm not really a fan of it. Uh, I played that one probably one of the that's one of the least uh, played games in my Vectrex uh, library. Was Crystal Chasm ported to the NES? It sounds like an NES game I played that was called Crystal. Mo no, there was Crystal Castles, if that's what you're thinking of. That's where he plays that honey bear, and it was a rollerball game. They did release that for the 2600. So it does exactly what it says on the box. Oh, rip off, ripped you off. Yeah, it rips you off. Yep, basically, rip off. What is it? A rip off of? It's a rip off of itself. <laughs> it reminds like it's it's another like asteroids type of game. It's just every every game was a rip off of Asteroids, Defender, or Space Invaders. I don't know why. Uh, here is Scramble. Um, this was the game that came when I got it. It was a card only. Uh, when it came with this, it was a card only, and I don't know who card only. So I did a trade with Nintendo. Got enough money from him, uh, or no, he bought it off of me. I uh, got enough money from him, and I ended up getting a complete copy with some other stuff that I had sold on eBay. And it's a side-scrolling shmup that's originally, I think, by Konami. And I think this came out for the... This must have come out for some other console. Maybe Atari 2600 or something like that. Um, but the Vectrex version is not very good. Uh, you can either shoot... You can shoot vertically the ships that are coming your way. And you also have the ability to bomb uh, things that are on the terrain beneath you. And you do need to keep refueling your ship with fuel uh, that you bomb on the, on the uh, ground level. And it'll fill up your tank. And it's not fun. It's not. Not really. This one is, though. This one is really cool. This one's called Spike. <laughs> uh, Spike is a platformer. And you play as this little star-faced guy. You see it here. He plays this little star-faced guy who's got his girlfriend. And there's someone trying to kidnap her. And uh, you basically are like doing like a 3D version of Donkey Kong. I don't know if you can really see it. Trying to per position it. You can kind of see it here. Uh, there's three levels, okay? And the, they're constantly scrolling, so they're kind of moving. It's, it's a, kind of isometric, maybe a two-thirds quarter view thing. And they're kind of always scrolling. And there's spaces you have to jump across. There's a ladder that you can move around to let you get up to the next level. There's three levels. She's always at the top of the third. Kind of like in Pac-Man, or uh, Donkey Kong. Don Pac-Man? What? Donkey Kong. And those enemies come at you, you have a kick move that you can do to kill them. And you get to the top, and you'll rescue your girl, but she always ends up getting kidnapped again, and then off to the next level. And there's actually voices in here, which is kind of neat. Those not, I mean, outside of that uh, stuff that you can see for the Intellivision, uh, it actually says here, you can see it in the front, it's like, Spike, help! And she will actually say it. You will hear it go, Spike, help! And it sounds really strange coming out of this. I could probably plug it in and have it happen, <laughs> if you really want. But it's really kind of cool to hear voices screaming at you from this game. And it's a lot of fun. It's a unique one. This is probably the most expensive game I have in my con my collection. And this came with the console. So I got this for 10 bucks, And this goes for over 300 I think. And that's Star Castle. It's a port of an arcade game. Uh, that's another variation of, like, Sinistron, I guess. Or not Sinistron. Was it Sinistron? No, Sinistron is a, tar is a TurboGrafx-16 game I keep looking at when I look above the camera. I'm thinking... Uh, Sinistar. <laughs> They're similar. I can get confused. Uh, basically, you play as this little ship. You can kind of see it on the front more. You play as this little ship up here, free roaming. And there's a ship in the center here that is covered by all these different barriers. And your whole plan, is to, your whole plot of the game is to chip away at those barriers and eventually shoot the thing in the center. And the thing is... It will regenerate the barrier. Uh, things will come at you and try to shoot you. And it's really complicated and really hard. But it's really fun and challenging. and Which is why I appreciate it the, as much as I do. This is a lot of fun to play. The game I'm thinking of had a space theme. So where you mined on a planet for crystals. Kind of like Dig Dug. Crystal Mines? That might be Crystal Mines. Edith Bunker. <laughs> Achi! <I'm Archie. laughs> Yeah, there was a there's a game called Crystal Mines. I think I have Crystal Mines 2 for the Lynx. If that is the one you're thinking of. This is the game right here that got me wanting to get a freaking Vectrex. Like, reignited my want for one. It was because went to um, a half-price books warehouse sale in 
and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I had always heard from the Midwest Gaming Classic that there was a store nearby called the Make Sense Variety Store that had like movies and video games and toys and collectibles and stuff like that. And I told my friends that went with me to that uh, warehouse sale that while we're up here, could we please check out, because they were driving, I'm like, could we please check out this Make Sense store? I want to see what it's all about. And we're like, yeah, sure. But I had spent so much money at the warehouse sale that I didn't have a whole lot to spend at the, st- the uh, store. So we walk in there, I'm looking around, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of cool. I wish I could add enough money to buy that, or I wish I had enough money to buy that. And then we walk into the front of the store where the, the um, register is, and there's like these glass cases that have like some of the more you know, sought after things in them. And one of them was this. And I, being the fan of this franchise that I am, I said, that's the thing I'm going to buy while I'm here. Even though I don't own the console yet, I was like, well, I told my friends, they're like, oh, are you going to go buy the, they, they said to me, like, are you going to buy the console now that you bought this game that you can't play? And I was like, no, I'm probably just going to keep it as a collectible. But the more I thought about the more I was like, you know, I always wanted that when I was a kid. I should probably try to find a way to own a Vectrex. And I did, just so I could play Star Trek The Motion Picture. It was called Crystal Mines? Yeah, I, there's, yeah, I have Crystal Mines too. Justin Zero, what's up, dude? <coughs> uh, what is going on? Oh, my throat is going so dry, I'm talking so much. Uh, but yeah, Star Trek The Motion Picture has nothing to do with Star Trek. Uh, remember I was talking about when it was brought up that uh, a t- the Star Wars arcade game would have been great ported to the Vectrex because of the type of game it was and the graphic style it used? Um, there was a Star Trek game, the Star Trek the Arcade game. I think it was a, ve- a vector-based game as well. And you actually had to sit inside this cockpit thing and shoot Klingons. You would expect that they would have just ported that game to the console and slapped the Star Trek the motion picture license on it. Uh, but no, they decided to make their own thing, and it has absolutely nothing to do with Star Trek. There are Klingons in it. Their ships look like nothing... They look nothing like any Klingon ship I've ever seen. They look like... freaking vultures <laughs> uh and there's like these weird ufo things that show up that i've never seen in an episode of star trek it's not good it's like a first person shooter kind of like um star raiders you know another game that gets copied all the time and it's not very good uh, this disappointed the hell out of me i was like wow i spent all that money on buying a vectrex just so i could play this game you dumb luckily i got all those other games with the console when i finally did get it one of which is the other super expensive game I have in my collection that I got for 10 bucks in that lot. And that's Web Wars. This is another sort of variation of Tempest. But it has a twist. What's a twist? Uh, it is... Like, there's a web, but it's scrolling. It's not like a, like a stationary thing. It's always moving kind of towards you. And you are moving within it. It's almost like it's a trench. But it's displayed as a web, which is why it's named what it is. And there's these things coming at you, and you can shoot them if you want, but your ship has, like, this tongue that'll come out, and you can capture the things that are coming at you and add them to your collection. Because at the end of every level, at the end of every stage, you are shown a trophy room. And you can see it, like, here's what a, what a, a stage would look like right here. But, I keep on, it's reversed on my screen here. You'll have, like, a trophy room. Like, these are the things that you manage to collect. Here it is. Oh, God, my finger. Those are the things you manage to collect in this stage. And it's really cool that it gives you that option. It's kind of like you get more points for collecting things than destroying them. So the thing is, they're shooting at you while they are you know, coming down the web towards you. So it's like a risk-reward thing, which is really fun. Really cool game. I'm glad that I own this one. And you know what, people? That is it. That is everything. That is all the Atari 2600 and Television, ColecoVision, and Vectric games I have in my collection currently. So, tell me. Collect uh, collect enemies like a reverse Galaga? Yeah, actually. Yeah. And it's, like I said, it's a cool mechanic. I, I've i never played a game you know from this generation that was anything like that, really. Which is kind of neat. Uh, there was a very, at least when it comes to the games that I own, there's like four games in here that are like just completely unique to this console that I never got to play something that was a ripoff of it or was a ripoff of anywhere else. So I'm really pleased. I need to start getting some more Vectrex games. They're really expensive, and I see them at the Midwest Gaming Classic usually. And usually there's a lot... If there's one console that has a huge homebrew community, it's the Vectrex. Holy shit. Every time I go to the Midwest Gaming Classic, there's like a table there that is all about the Vectrex, and there's like ten games there that are like homebrews. I should probably pick a few of them up. I probably should. I probably will this year. Maybe.
Hmm. We'll see. Uh, but let me know if you really do you think any of those games should be remade. Uh, Spike would be cool. <coughs> the Fortress of Narzad, definitely. Yeah, I would say so. I would like to see like a console or a or an arcade perfect version of some of these. I mean, I know the graphics won't look exactly like they were, they did in the arcade because you know you're not going to be able to replicate vector things unless you actually have something that can do the vector style graphics like the Vectrex can. But you know, having like a, an arcade perfect version of like Star Castle on some compilation somewhere would be really neat. But this is the first. This is like an experiment right now. If you guys really like this kind of a collection thing, I can do one every week. Uh, the next one would probably be the Famicom and the NES. The Famicom, the Famicom Disk System, and the NES. <coughs> How's it going, Sebastian? Welcome to the stream. Too bad it's about to end. <laughs> um, so, if you guys like this kind of thing of just me talking about the games in my collection and like the stories behind them uh, as I recategorize re everything, or, you know, tr like I'm saying, I'm trying to have like a visual record of everything that I have in my collection just in case something happens. And this is a cool way to do it. And a fun way to do it. So if you guys like this, I might do another one next week. I'm, I'll, I'll do another one next Thursday. And then, <coughs> Wow, my throat is just going completely dry. Shit. Vectrex party don't stop. <laughs> um, so if I do the next one, the next one will be, like I said, the Famicom, the Famicom Disk System, and the NES. Uh, then I'll probably do the Genesis after... No, I'll probably do the Master System after that. I might, maybe I'll mix the Master System in with the NES because they're kind of the same generation. And I don't have that many Master System games, so mixing them in with the NES might be good. So then the third one will probably be the Genesis, to answer your question. Watch all these YouTube vids! Yes, like, that is my plan. <laughs> I have renter's insurance. It'll happen. Uh, so... Uh, if you guys really want me to do another one, I'll do another one next Thursday, and it'll be, like I said, about the Famicom, Famicom Disk System, and the NES. And I'd be happy to do so, because I love just chatting with everybody and, you know, telling stories about, you know, these games, and if I, if we get into the NES, if next, the next one will be long as shit, because I'm pretty sure 90% of the games in my collection, I have a story behind them with me, so be ready. So, oh, I got plenty for the links, I got, like, pretty much what two-thirds of the complete collection for the links already and that was within the space of a month i did that because they're cheap as shit that'll be later <laughs> um so uh like i said give the thumbs up to the to the video and like if if we pass up like 15 thumbs ups i'll do another one next week and see how that goes and if as long as people are seem to be enjoying them i'll just keep going until i'm you know through the switch which justin loves i know it you know it. Everyone knows it. Uh, so, let me know, and we'll make this happen. So, like I said, if we pass 15 thumbs ups on this, I'll I'll definitely do a Nintendo one next week. And I look forward to doing it. Like I said, I love talking about this stuff. So, Donk Duba! Donk Duba. <laughs> look up Donk Duba's, like Justin just typed, um, on YouTube, and you're going to find some magic. <laughs> Uh, so thanks for, for sticking around for this pretty long stream. I mean, how long has it been? It's been almost two hours. So that's me talking about just this stuff. Can you imagine what the NES one's going to be about? I have like over 150 NES games. That's going to take a while. So let's get this over with. So Thank you for watching. I appreciate everyone being here and chatting with me. And this was a lot of fun. And I hope to talk to you later. And like it looks like next week, yeah, we're gonna have an NES. We're gonna have an NES overnighter. You bet your ass, it's happening. <laughs> till midnight, streaming, talking about Nintendo games till midnight. Yes. Why are you late to work, Chris? I was talking about Nintendo games until midnight. You're fired. <laughs> Like, come up with a better excuse next time. So, <laughs> I will talk to you all next time. Like, again, thanks again for watching. I appreciate every single person for being here and chatting. And uh, this is Chris, the old-ass retro gamer, signing off. Have a good night, everybody.